Attack the Block Monsters, Big Alien Gorilla Explained. The film revolves around a street gang who fights extraterrestrial invaders in London on Guy Fawkes Night. Both Joe Cornish and John Boyega made their big screen debut with this movie. The movie also stars Jodie Whittaker, Alex Ismael, Nick Frost, Leon Jones, Jumaian Hunter, Simon Howard, and Luke Tradeaway. The movie has received several international accolades in prestigious events such as the Los Angeles Film Festival, SXSW 2011, and Torino Film Festival. You'll know exactly why once we get into the video. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Them things are pure coming down. Yeah, they say same as what? That's what hit that car before. Plot summary. The movie begins as trainee nurse Samantha Adams, played by Jodie Whittaker, walks home through Brixton on Guy Fawkes night. She is mugged by a gang from the hood. Dennis, played by Franz Pest, played by Alex Ishmael, Jerome, played by Leon Jones, Biggs, played by Simon Howard, and their leader, Moses, played by John Boyega. Replacing cops due to their incompetence in protecting the people, Samantha is instead saved by a meteorite crashing onto a car. She escapes as Moses scurries through the car to find something valuable. A creature suddenly scratches him. It was pale, hairless, eyeless, and dogless, as in 18th century beauty standards for women. Apparently, the meteorite in question was its cocoon. It runs away, but the gang chases it and kills it. They expect to get money for its corpse and take it to their weed dealer, Ron, played by Nick Frost. They look for advice for what to do with it. Moses asks Ron and Hi-Hats, i.e. Ron's boss and local gangster, to keep it in the weed room. More creature cocoons fall from the sky, and since the gang wants to secure the bag, they arm themselves and go to the crash site to get more of them. This time, however, the creatures were almost gorilla-sized and had pitch-black spiky fur with glowing fangs and huge claws. They run away, but two policemen catch them. They identify Moses as the mugger, as Samantha had filed a complaint against him, and he is arrested. The aliens attack the police and their van, killing them, as Moses is trapped inside with Samantha. Dennis drives the car away and crashes it into Hi-Hat's car. That makes his car a crash symbol. Samantha flees while the gang catches up to confront Hi-Hat's, who is now enraged due to the damage. He threatens the gang with a gun and refuses to believe their story about the aliens. It is then that a creature attacks one of his henchmen, and the gang flee. They try to get to the Wyndham Tower, only to find more aliens chasing them. Biggs hides in a dumpster while Pest is bitten in the leg. Turns out, Samantha lives in Wyndham Tower, so they force themselves into her apartment and try to convince her to treat Pest's leg. It is then that an alien comes in, but Moses drives a samurai sword into its head. He finds that sword because plot armor is keeping him alive. Samantha realizes that their alien story was in fact true, and that staying with them would have been safer than being alone, because all the aliens are bad, and the villains and humans are good. And the heroes, well, you know the drill. They all move upstairs to the apartment of girls they know, but of course, the aliens attack them once again by climbing the tower block and smashing the windows. One alien bites Dennis through his helmet, crushing his skull, and killing him, as it would. Another one tries to kill Moses, but he splits the water in half, and the creature has a spiritual awakening. No, that didn't happen. Samantha stabs it through the head and saves Moses. The girls realize that the aliens are targeting the gang, so they just kick them out to save themselves. It is then that Hi-Hats and his henchmen, the toms, cymbals, bass drums, and kicks attack the gang in the hall. They escape, and an alien runs after Hi-Hats and his gang into an elevator. Hi-Hats kills it, but his crew is all dead. The gang makes it to Ron's weed room and finds more aliens. They use fireworks as a distraction and manage to escape. Maybe the aliens were feeling like a plastic bag drifting through the wind, wanting to start again. <laughs> Jerome gets killed by an alien, while the rest of them find hi-hats in Ron's flat. He prepares to shoot Moses, a blasphemy if you ask me, but aliens smash into hi-hats and tear his face off. Moses, Samantha, and Pest are joined by Bruis, Ron's customer, and they go back to the weed room while Ron hides in the flat. Bruis uses ultraviolet light and finds a luminescent stain on Moses' jacket. He comes up with the theory that the aliens were like spores that drifted through space on solar winds until they landed on a habitable planet. 
Once they chance upon an area with enough food, the female lets off strong pheromones to attract the males for mating and multiplying their species because they are not yet aware of the risks of overpopulation. Moses makes the gang return the ring they had stolen from Samantha, and they formulate a plan. She goes to Moses' flat and turns on the gas oven. She bypasses the aliens since she did not have the pheromones on her and leaves the tower block. Moses straps the corpse of a small alien to his back, making it the latest hawk look for the runaways, and runs to the gas-filled apartment. The aliens follow him because they thought it was the female due to the pheromones. They are certainly thirsty. Moses throws the alien corpse there and ignites the room with fireworks. As he leaps out the window, the place explodes. The aliens and the rest of the block are now on fire. Moses, Ron, Pest, and Bruis are arrested in the end for causing the deaths of people around the block. When the cops ask Samantha to identify them, she defends them by saying they were her neighbors and protected her. While sitting in a police van, Moses and Pest hear the residents of the block cheering for Moses and they smile. The movie ends. Something cool about the filming of this movie is that director Joe Cornish interviewed several kids to find what kind of weapons they'd use during an alien invasion. He had asked one of the girls what she would think of this creature if she found it. She replied that she wouldn't touch it because she wouldn't want to get chlamydia. That dialogue went straight into the script. What exactly is this alien like? The aliens in the movie make their appearance when they crash land on Earth in cocoons resembling meteorites, while a local gang attempted to mug a trainee nurse. They do not have a name, but they are in fact a species. It's not just one alien causing havoc in South London. The alien creatures in Attack the Block are very animalistic, having long legs. They are all quadrupedal and similar to animals with four legs, and possess claws and fangs. However, their fangs are not just the stereotypical design. Being extraterrestrial creatures, their physical appearance is quite out of this world. They have several rows of fangs that look like they have LED lights implanted on them. Their skin is also pitch black. In fact, it is so black that rarely any light bounces off of it. They do not have visible eyes or noses. This could be to one of two reasons. One, they do not have eyes and noses, resembling, of all creatures, wild mutt from Ben 10. They are also so dark that their features are not visible. The neon fangs are probably detrimental to the character design, because there has to be some way to make them look visible, despite the lack of light reflection, as the fangs do. This one is for all my Greek mythology nerds out there. As the bodies of the aliens are just darkness, it is hard to differentiate between them when they are all together. You can only count them when their fangs are visible. When that happens, they do look eerily similar to Cerebus, the Hound of Hades. It's a multi-headed dog responsible for guarding the gates of the underworld. When the aliens get together, their bodies are barely visible, so it looks like a multi-headed dog growling. In some ways, this character design is very slick. Because sci-fi films require bigger budgets due to requirements such as visual effects and CGI, it is hard to pull off a lower budget sci-fi film without it looking like a badly produced product. However, Cornish as the writer has played smart in this regard. By making the aliens so dark that their visibility reduces, the film ultimately ends up saving a lot of money which they would have had to spend on the production costs, which they would have had to spend on production costs on visual effects. The aliens have their own communication style using shrieks, sonar, snarls, screams, and growls to interact with each other. As a species, they are sexually dimorphic. The females are as big as a large dog. They are also pale and hairless. Contrary to that, the males are as big as gorillas and have a thick coat of very spiky fur and pitch black. They are the ones with the glowing fangs, often mistaken for eyes. The color of their blood is somewhere between black and blue. Huh? That's not During the scene where Bruce used ultraviolet light on Moses, he saw the luminescent stain on Moses. This caused him to come up with a convincing theory about the extraterrestrial creatures. He believed that these creatures were alien invaders who did not come from any particular planet, but instead were spores which floated through space and looking for a planet to infest. As they are sexually dimorphic, the male and female have separate roles in this process. The female searches for a habitable planet for the rest of the species and excretes a musk-like fluid, working similar to pheromones in humans. Once the males come to that planet, they detect the female's fluid and attempt to track her down for mating. This is because they wish to populate the planet with their own species. This fluid is not visible to the naked eye, but ultraviolet light will detect it. 
The first creature who appeared in the film was the female itself. Before being killed, it had already excreted its fluid on Moses. This is why, as the males approached on Earth, they desperately chased him and those around him. They were also the reason that they could track the gang down, no matter how safe they thought they were. It is evident that the species are quite an aggressive one. The female is debatable in this matter as she attacked Moses as defense. With its musk on Moses, it is quite strange why the male creatures were trying to kill him, despite its goal being mating. The origin is not known, but having spent time theorizing where it could have come from, it contradicts myself. The dark color of the creature exists due to the higher production of melanin. The melanin production depends on how close one is to the ultraviolet radiation of the sun. This fundamental mechanism is the same in all creatures. Let's assume that the alien has skin that requires protection. They obviously originate from a space that is close to the sun, or just about any star in the universe. They have four legs, which means their origin goes back to a place with gravitational pull. So they come from a planet or an asteroid similar to Earth, but hotter. What other planet could it be than Venus, which is believed to have supported life about 700 million years ago? It is believed that Venus once had a climate similar to that of Earth, and possibly even supported life for 2 to 3 billion years. Due to drastic climactic changes, a runaway greenhouse effect was triggered. Today, Venus is incredibly dense, hot, and toxic, just like your ex. It's possible the creatures are inherently from Venus. Due to its closer proximity to the sun, it is obviously hotter, so their coats are pitch black. But life became unsustainable sustainable for them following the destruction of its climate. They became spores drifting through space with the help of solar winds. They possibly developed cocoons to help them deal with the cold and vacuum in space. As a species, they are looking to repopulate and exist instead of simply surviving. This can be argued easily because the females are pale. This is just a theory though. Brewis himself came up with the trivia on the alien while theorizing. He himself could be wrong as well. For all we know, we all might be wrong, but it certainly is fun to think about this stuff. What did we think about Attack the Block? When the movie begins, we see Moses and his gang in an antagonizing light. They are a bunch of thugs from South London trying to mug an innocent woman on the streets for money. This happens as she turns to an empty street on Guy Fox night while trying to get home. The gang has its faces covered with bandanas while they're on their bikes and are holding a knife to her. We don't even know them yet, so the movie initially gives off the vibe that they are the villains, while Samantha is probably the protagonist. Then the female alien comes in, with its meteorite-esque cocoon crashing nearby, and the story gradually begins to pick up. Cornish asks some very difficult questions to its audience, but he does it so subtly. The gang we once demonized for mugging Samantha, the thugs we hated for killing a creature for the sake of fame and fortune, and the hoodlums we were made to demonize simply because we knew nothing about them, finally come to the surface as the plot unravels. Moses quickly becomes a fan-favorite protagonist. We find ourselves actively rooting for him in his fight against alien invaders. How does it relate to being a social commentary? Countries like the United States and the UK are dominated by a white crowd that has often marginalized people of color, in particular, black people. Several racists use the argument that black people commit more crimes to justify their racism. It is important to look deeper into the matter and think about why so many black youth feel the need to take the path of crime. The feds, mate. Take it. In a modern day society, the rich get richer. As a marginalized community who have been pushed to certain boundaries, denied equal rights and equal space in society, it is exponentially harder for black people to simply have the same opportunities as their white counterparts. But money makes the world go round. You need to feed your family, and for that, you need money. When you're in a space which constantly denies you the ability to earn a livelihood decent enough to sustain a family with decent living standards, or even a necessary education, sometimes you are forced to go down a different path. In Attack the Block, despite meeting Moses and his gang as a bunch of thugs, we eventually get to know more of them, and even begin to side with them. It is quite the same in society. During a scene, Moses and his friend think that the government sent the aliens to their housing project. This shows how poorly they are treated in society. Theories as extreme as this are not born out of thin air. They come from several instances of extreme things happening over and over again, which makes the oppressed believe that anything is possible, even in a negative sense. People are doing things out of need, but using that as an excuse to call someone dangerous or demonize them is where the problem begins. Especially when the reason they take a more unconventional route is caused by the same people who are the critics. In the end, 
Moses is the hero as he defeats the real villains of the movie, and yet the police arrest him because in the real world people will not remember his good deeds, only the bad ones. You can do a thousand good things, but one good action will make everyone forget about all the good. However, he does win the support of many, which leaves a little glimmer of hope for everyone. Social commentary aside, the movie is entertaining through and through, not just in an adrenaline-inducing way, but also with its monologues and character interactions. There's humor, and there is fun. It is ultimately an exciting watch with morally ambiguous message. Is there going to be a sequel for Attack the Block? Joe Cornish and John Boyega met up in the summer of 2020 to discuss a possible sequel for Attack the Block, and it is finally happening. The official announcement was made on May 17, 2021, even though rumors had been circulating for quite some time. The announcement also coincided with the movie's 10-year anniversary. There is currently no release date at this time, yet. All that is known is it is going into production in 2022, so 2023 seems like a probable time for its release. John Boyega is definitely going to reprise his role as Moses. He will probably be joined by Jodie Whittaker, Alex Ishmael, and Nick Frost. Of course, new cast members will be joining the team as the franchise gets better. Hopefully, we will get to see the aliens once again, and this time, we might get a backstory about them. The sequel will probably go down the path of entertainment infused with ambiguous social commentary. As the aliens return, we might see Moses trying to understand what they actually want. We might see a new, softer side to the aliens, and personally, we would love to see Moses bond with them. To be honest, the first film ended with a closure, so it does not leave much to the imagination with reference to the alien invasion. As Moses was sent to jail with Pest, we are likely to get the story of their return. Maybe Samantha helped them out, or maybe they've been serving sentences, but a new alien invasion requires Moses' expertise, as he had thwarted the previous one. Only time will tell where Cornish wants this story to head towards. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone. I can see his eyes. Not sure them things is eyes.